to start now good morning to all of you i welcome you all to the second webinar organized by the college of chemical pathologists of sri lanka for year 2022 i'm honored to introduce our speaker today dr dilipika pereira consultant chemical pathologist currently attached to sirimavo bandaranayaka specialized children's hospital peradeniya Dr. Dilipika Pereira is a senior consultant chemical pathologist with experience in working in many reputed hospitals in Sri Lanka as well as overseas. After her postgraduate training in Sri Lanka, uh, she went overseas for her foreign training at Guy's and St Thomas NHS Foundation Trust London, and after one year training, she worked as a registrar chemical pathology in Oxford University Hospital Oxford After returning to Sri Lanka up to now she had worked in many hospitals including teaching hospital Kurunagala uh, she is also an assessor to Sri Lanka accreditation board Today uh, Dr Dilinika is going to share her knowledge with us about patient safety in laboratory medicine Dear Dilinika, thank you for accepting our invitation to be a speaker today with a short notice and allocating your time for us in spite of your busy schedule. We are grateful for your presence here today and I'm sure that this will be a valuable experience for all the attendees present in this meeting today. Over to you Dilinika. Thank you very much uh, Dr. Kisali. and uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity uh, to uh, uh, present this uh, patient safety in laboratory medicine so special thank to dr kisali and the college and um, so next 45 minutes i'm going to um give some uh, introduction total uh, regarding the total testing process and what are the types of laboratory errors and what are the corrections we have to take uh, uh, during this laboratory errors so as you can see this is our laboratory the processes which start from the pre analytical phase and the analytical phase and the post analytical phase and there will be like um, assessments and uh, results reportings and feedbacks from the clinicians and other parties so do our patient safe uh, in uh, uh, in our laboratories um, so there are some guidelines as well as uh, some reports regarding the patient safety uh, Uh, during this report uh, validation and issuing yes there are some errors so basically um patient safety what do you mean by patient safety in laboratory medicine is to prevent and minimize laboratory errors so compared with other types of medical errors in hospitals errors in the laboratory medicine have received little attention so why this is little attention one thing is Uh, the laboratory errors are very insidious and difficult to pinpoint in time and places and uh, apparent, uh, actually speaking it is most of the time it is neglected and it is complex so why it is neglected and complex one thing is there is number of steps and uh, when we speak in this analytical pre analytical and the post analytical phases the only the analytical phase falls directly under the laboratory uh, control so what about this pre analytical and the post analytical phase they are responsibility not only ours and it responsibility goes to the other stakeholders so making this is really difficult so uh, there is like uh, technical specifications given by um, uh, iso uh, ts Two two three six seven regarding this uh, uh, the definition. So that is the fail of plan action to be completed in as intended or use a wrong plan to achieve an aim. 
occurring at any part of the laboratory cycle from ordering examination to reporting results and appropriately interpreting and reacting to them. So this is uh, actually uh, so um, the technically uh, this specification of a laboratory error. So broadly, uh, I have uh, um, already mentioned about this pre-analytical, uh, analytical, and the post-analytical phases. But most frequently, the source of errors in the uh, errors nowadays is pre-analytical and post-analytical, which contributes to seventy percent of the total errors in the laboratory medicine. So as you can see, this is like analytical phase. We can see like very clearly, but uh, what happens to this post-analytical and the pre-analytical phases? This is like, uh, we can't see, right? Like uh, of a tip of an iceberg, we see only the analytical phase. So what will happen is, so errors in, will occur in the patients, will compromise the patient diagnosis and uh, especially and the patient management. So this is one example of a consequence of erroneous results uh, due to thyroid function tests. So uh, in, uh, uh, you can see uh, this uh, in percentage wise, they have mentioned because of the erroneous thyroid function tests, 37% uh, of patients given erroneous thyroxy and some of them underwent like scanning and uh, there are the variations in the, uh, the doses of the thyroxine. And um, so, and um, uh, even some of them uh, are given, uh, like uh, they have uh, underwent uh, very uh, dangerous procedures as well. So we have to make sure that we are giving a correct report to patient. So this is a, a study done by Mario Pleban in Italy. So uh, they have conducted uh, to see the detection prevention of errors in laboratory medicine and mention the percentage relative frequency of uh, the uh, phase. And uh, they conducted uh, to see the total testing process and they found the type of errors and the percentages. So as you can see, I mean, the main uh, contribution by the pre-analytical and uh, post-analytical. So other thing I have to mention here is, uh, so they categorize this pre-analytical phase as pre-pre-analytical, pre-analytical, and um, post-analytical phase as post-analytical and post-post-analytical for the categorization. So that is the total testing process, where in uh, the pre-pre-analytical phase is mainly uh, outside the laboratory. And post post one was the, uh, mainly beyond the laboratory from uh, so they uh, basically they are not directly controlled uh, in from the laboratories. So uh, further, this study shows that impact of errors in laboratory medicine on patient outcomes. So what is the patient's effect and adverse events? So there are references uh, four references. So they have done a number of studies to see how much adverse events occurs in these patients. So a little bit about the journey of laboratory errors. So before 1990, high rates and, uh, and the of analytical errors will be more. But after 1990, dramatic decrease in the analytical error. Why is that? Because of the standardization of the analytical techniques, reagents, instrumentations and advances in information technology and people used to use quality controls and the majority of them uh, they uh, un, uh, they use uh, quality assurance methods so because of that uh, the analytical uh, errors has become reduced so this is the journey from 1950 to 1990 more analytical errors nowadays is predominantly uh, pre-analytical and post-analytical errors. So there are some studies and audits done uh, worldwide regarding these laboratory errors. And uh, the uh, once the College of Am uh, American Pathologists conduct uh, using 120 labs, and they found the commonest laboratory errors is a misidentification. And there is a Danish study done uh, found that 81% uh, of the errors due to pre-analytical phase and 10% is analytical, 
out of those majority is human errors rather than technical errors so these things are very important to identify our errors as well so a little bit about the total testing process so what is this total testing process it is generation of any laboratory test results involves nine steps starting from ordering collection patient identification sample transportation separation analysis reporting and action so all the steps are very much important when you are talking regarding the laboratory errors so the uh, total testing process quality in the laboratory medicine so um, each and every step where i have mentioned we have to perform correctly and this will assure valuable medical decision makings and effective patient care so why these errors the reason for neglect in the laboratory errors so one thing is it is very heterogeneous and there are ambiguous definitions of what a laboratory error and uh, so other thing is we sometimes we can't identify the types of errors uh, because there are no certain protocols uh, to go to there are no clear steps or guidelines and um, other thing is we are dealing with other stakeholders so the cooperation and communication with the other uh, clinicians is very much important and uh, the physicians and other parties they are having very poor perception and uh, sometimes they don't know regarding these laboratory errors and as laboratory professionals sometimes we are also reluctant to report and disclose data on types of errors and their frequency so if we communicate with the clinicians very clearly and then i think most of the laboratory errors we can prevent it and there are a certain uh, alternative procedures like point of care testing and blood gas analysis they are sometimes most of the time it is uh, it is not under our control so we don't know whether they are uh, running uh, proper quality control doing maintenance so those things also can contribute to lab, uh, the errors which uh, is also uh, error so um i have described about the pre analytical phase actually this is the most vulnerable part of the total testing process and this is the most challenging phase so it is still the remaining uh, a challenging phase for the uh, laboratory consultants so there are some quality uh, um, in the pre analytical phase the iso guidelines mention about the requirements by 15189 so the uh, so uh, the pre analytical errors starting from the clinical with re uh, clinicians request and uh, so the laboratory preparation of the sample before analysis so this throughout this process is the um, the pre analytical error can occur so um it starts from the patient identification patient preparations the completeness of the request form uh, whether it is a hand request or the electronic requesting selecting the site site preparation tourniquet applications and uh, proper vena puncture techniques also important and order of draw tube mixing correct specimen volume tube handling labeling and sample accepting and rejecting uh, rejection criteria centrifugation procedures special handling of some of the samples and the stability of the samples so the patient identification is very much important so which is the critical first step in the blood collection right so we have come across patients the the sample collected from a wrong person that will be the worst clinical outcome sometimes drawing uh, of blood from a wrong person or labeling of the correct person samples with a different patient's labels also can occur at least three parameters uh, has to be there to identify patient name address identification number or date of birth in other countries most often they use the date of birth and uh, from that they uh, the they generate barcodes so um mainly they found that patient identification errors most often occurs during manual tasks so if so because i am telling these things 
because we also can upgrade our laboratories and we can use these newer technologies to reduce laboratory errors. So if we can use like um, electronic technology like barcoding, radio frequency identifications or wristbands, right? In hospital inpatients, so in other countries, they, uh, they wear a wristband. So because if you, uh, in, in Sri Lanka most of the time, so if you call by a name, right? So there are so many people in the ward by the name. So other countries, they don't do, uh, they don't use, uh, do that. So because of that, the errors will be minimal. So incomplete laboratory request form, this is like a, a headache for in Sri Lankan request forms. We are very incomplete and hardly they write uh, legibly because most of, most of the time they are hand requests. So mistakes in patient identification uh, is uh, they found that 20 up to 25% of pre-analytical errors is due to this uh, um, errors in the request form. And um, prevention is by electronic request and barcode uh, system reduce these errors. And wrong labeling of the containers in sometimes people used the first they collect the sample and then they label the, uh, 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 the sample. So that is wrong. So initially you have to label the specimen first, uh, the tube first, and then collect to that container. So because of labeling errors, uh, it is very hard to find uh, where it has gone wrong. And other thing is the responsibility. We have to prepare the patient properly before sample collection, whether this patient needs fasting, for an example, for fasting plasma glucose or lipid profile and the duration and the hormone, preferably at eight to nine a.m. because we all know that most of the hormones, especially like cortisol, there's dynamic variation, the highest level will be, will be in the morning and gradually it decrease towards the course of the day. So, uh, Suppose if somebody performed the test in the evening or at night, and if they are going to interpret the results with the morning reference ranges, so there will be erroneous results and the interpretation will be wrong. And the utmost important thing is the phlebotomy. So phlebotomist has to practice good phlebotomy techniques in order to minimize the trauma to patient and reduce the risk of recollection and reduce the uh, risk of hemolysis. Posture. Patient has to be uh, seated or supine for at least 20 minutes before sampling. So don't never ever take the sample when the patient is standing. Selecting the site. So that is also important. So to take a better quality sample, uh, the, uh, the phlebotomist has to uh, select a proper site, especially median cubital vein will be the proper site. And in hospitals, we come across a lot of samples with drip arms. So there will be like a lot of erroneous reports we are issuing because of samples collected from a drip arm. And other thing is uh, clenching fist for longer duration causes elevation in the serum CK, LDH and potassium and the pediatric, uh, the lot of squeezing and hemolysis is common. So like this, uh, like pediatric uh, uh, patient sample phlebotomies, we can instruct them to take, uh, like use like uh, maybe butterfly needles or uh, the uh, phlebotomies must be a very um, experienced person because uh, then they can take sample without uh, difficulty. Site usually we uh, prepare with the alcohol. Alcohol has to be allowed to air dry. If this alcohol is contaminated with the sample, it will cause hemolysis. Tourniquet application. This is also an area where some people were uh, uh, in a problem whether to apply uh, the tourniquet or not. Yes, we can apply tourniquet, but for a short duration, if it is like less than one minute, it won't much affect the results. If you apply tourniquet for a long time, that will be increased the various chemistry analytes such as serum protein, total calcium, potassium, and lactic acid. So what we can do is for total calcium, so we can adjust it for albumin. So because we don't know whether this, uh, uh, the phlebotomist, whether they have used tourniquet or not. So better to do 
adjusted calcium with the albumin rather than doing total calcium. Or at least if the total calcium results is abnormal, please do adjusted calcium levels because otherwise they will do like parathyroid hormones and scanning a lot of uh, like uh, they will be doing lots, lot, lots of uh, unnecessary investigations. And a proper venomancia technique, right? So excessive probing, uh, find the vein, uh, the probing uh, um, several times can uh, cause hemolysis. And uh, they follow the correct order of draw. Actually, this is not for the manual collections. Uh, this is uh, uh, basically uh, the clinical and laboratory institute uh, described. Uh, this is uh, uh, so uh, how to collect uh, when you are using. Um, uh, so this is the order of draw we mentioned here. And uh, so first we have take for blood culture bottles and then the coagulation uh, and the serum tube without clot activator uh, or gel separator, heparin tubes, EDTN. Last we have used for glycolytic inhibitor. Right. So this is basically uh, uh, to avoid contamination uh, with the uh, preservatives or additives like EDTN, glycolytic inhibitors. So in our hospitals, they are usually most of the time, I, what I have seen is, so first they put the sample into EDTA and then to the serum. So which contributes uh, loads and loads of potassium EDTA contamination in the hospital. And correct specimen volume is, uh, we have to check whether this sample is correctly, the volume is correct. And the one thing is the, whether this amount is adequate for the testing. And other thing is if there are some additives, so we have to check with this blood to additive ratio is correct. And um, um, they have to avoid vigorous shaking, which causes hemolysis. Why these uh, yeah, problems will occur? Uh, why the correct specimen volume, they won't take it? One thing is ignorance of the phlebotomist. And other thing is uh, uh, difficult sampling, such as in pediatric patients and the people who are on chemotherapy. Uh, so they they uh, difficult to localize their veins. So this contamination, the potassium EDTA contamination is uh, very much important and it is commonly seen in the hospital setups. And uh, important thing is we have to identify potassium EDTA contamination, right? So, so what we can see is hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia due to precipitation uh, uh, by EDTA, calcium and magnesium, and low alkaline phosphatase is due to hypomagnesemia, which requires for the testing process. So how can we identify whether this is true potassium EDTA contamination? So what we can do is one thing, we can add on calcium and magnesium and calcium phosphatase level and see whether they are low, but if it is like a very mild to subtle uh, uh, contamination, sometimes we will miss it. So if, and we can add on creatinine and see whether this patient is having uh, uh, like acute or chronic kidney disease, but sometimes it is not because of uh, uh, kidney problem, maybe due to drug, uh, we have to check the drug history, such as potassium sparing diuretics also can cause hyperkalemia. And other countries, in some parts of the countries, uh, other uh, like other um, uh, countries, they perform EDT level on each and every sample. So one center I worked there, so they, they used to do EDT level each and every sample. So if there's in subtle EDT contamination, so they will reject the sample. And what are the other contaminations like lithium, lithium heparin, you can't take samples for lithium to lithium heparin. So for ammonia, ammonium heparin, sodium, sodium heparin, and sodium or potassium EDTA. So we can't take uh, samples for sodium, uh, uh, calcium, and magnesium. So hyper, uh, uh, so that is other thing is uh, a pseudo hypernatremia. So this pseudo hypernatremia, this is due to contamination with sodium citrate or trisodium citrate, we known as citraloc, right? So the citraloc we used to uh, the lock central vein, uh, so that is the central venous catheters to maintain the latency of the cathe catheter. They use a sodium citrate or the trisodium citrate which is having very high concentration of sodium, so 120 millimoles per sodium liter, 
but this is not commonly seen. But if you suspect, so better to ask for a, a, another or fresh sample. And other common thing in hospital setup is uh, intravenous fluid contamination. So what we see is erroneously low results. And if the sample is taken from the dextrose cream pump, the plasma glucose level will be high. So if you suspect, better to uh, take a, 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 a fresh sample. And uh, actually, so we have to advise phlebotomists to take us uh, always take the sample from uh, uh, the uh, from uh, uh, not from the drip bar. So we are like uh, even though we are laboratory consultants, we have to instruct the phlebotomists and we have to have like meetings or education pro programs uh, regularly, right? So because some uh, when I um, uh, did a lecture for nursing staff when I was working in the uh, Corona so none of them they know about the EDTA contamination, right? So that is important because most of the things we have to communicate with them, we have to give the education. And um, other problem is in, the, especially hospital setup, they are very uh, heavy workload. And we have discussed for staff allocation and uh, we can't just ignore them. We need uh, some uh, continuous monitoring and discussions. And, uh, uh, the important thing is we have to instruct them to take from a proper needle. The needle size is 21 gauge will be preferable and uh, instruct regard. I think that is a technical error with Dr. Dilenika. We will just wait for a few minutes. Sort of some uh, like uh, maybe um... Can you see, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Dhrinika, we can see you and uh, uh, I think you can share the slide. So I have already shared, can you see this slide? Yes, can see. Okay, right, thank you. Um, right, and uh, so the special handling is uh, what I have talked about this parathyroid hormones, ACT. So these, what I have come with, some of the samples, it transferred uh, to the Medical Research Institute from Coronagala uh, to a, a, a plain tube. So nobody has checked uh, uh, because it is, I have uh, like uh, once I had a complaint from uh, an endocrinologist where we have sent the sample without any preparation. So came as undetectable, right? So you know if the, uh, uh, the by doing parathyroid hormone, so they are trying to make a diagnosis. Uh, they are narrowing down the differential diagnosis. So, so ideally uh, for this uh, PTH, ACT, and AC, uh, ACE patient, better to send the patient to the laboratory rather than sending from very far away stations. And avoid hemolysis and squeezing for ammonia, lactic acid, and pyruvate. And there are like special preparations required for inborn errors of metabolism samples. I'm not going to discuss. So there are guidelines in the 
uh, uh, present in the late Ridgeway Hospital. And transport to the laboratory is, uh, we have to prioritize the sample for the transport uh, sent to the laboratory. It, could, it can be hand carry or courier or pneumatic tubes. So this is the pneumatic tubes we are using in other countries. So they send sample directly from the wards to the laboratory and uh, the empty carriers we are sending from the laboratory to the ward. So the, uh, the sample, the delay in uh, transit will be very minimum. So this will come within few minutes. So uh, if we can, like uh, in our laboratory, so this is like uh, our future dream uh, to have a numeric tube system in our hospitals as well. So once we receive in the laboratory, so, uh, so apply, verify sample label. Uh, if we need barcodes, we have to make the barcode systems and identify the stat tests or what I did uh, in when I was in Kurunagla, so I used to uh, have a special request forms for like uh, for urgent testing because if you use the same request form, if if just uh, the doctor write it as urgent, but hardly anybody can see. So what I did was I make a different color, like purple color. So for the special uh, uh, like uh, PBUs, ICUs. Uh, and very urgent testing like uh, at uh, A&E. So what we can pick those things very quickly and we can uh, do uh, stat testing as soon as possible. And uh, uh, for the prepare, uh, that we have to prepare for testing. So if we centrifuge small volumes, what will happen is it can cause hemolysis. And we have to, we have to be very uh, like very cautious when we are allocating the samples, because we have to make a proper labeling of that sample. Tubes, uh, we have to allow to clot uh, at room temperature, uh, upright in the test tube pack, and it has to be closed because if it is a small volume, it can be evaporated. And better to use gel or clot activated tubes because it is less time to clot. And to keep in your mind, blood from a patient who are receiving anti Coagulants therapy take a longer time to clot. So please don't rush and uh, do the centrifugation. The samples will be hemolyzed. And the other thing is, if you spin the uh, samples too quick before uh, um, clotting of the sample, what will happen is there will be a gelatinous and fibrinous system sample that will require re-spinning uh, will be there. And there will be like a gelatinous component, which uh, will uh, uh, difficulties in analyzing. And if you do further centrifugation, again, hemolysis is common. So please allow them to at least uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes to clot if it is a plain tube, but a gel or clot activated tube, it will be very quick. So please introduce uh, gel or clot activated tubes into your laboratories. And um, a little bit about the hemolysis, because the hemolysis is the one, uh, one of the most common uh, pre-analytical error which we encounter, which causes elevation of potassium, AST, AL, uh, ALT, sometimes uh, even uh, some to a certain extent creatinine. Um, but it all depends about the amount of hemolysis, whether it is mild, moderate, or severe. And some of the parameters will be underestimated. Discuss about this one and transport to the laboratory. I think I have already discussed about the pneumatic tubes, laboratory receiving in the laboratory, uh, prepare for testing uh, and hemolysis and uh, how to prevent hemolysis. Um, yes. So um, how to him, uh, prevent hemolysis is to, um, the majority of the rejections where I have mentioned about it is due to the hemolysis. So avoid alcohol contamination, vigorous shaking of tubes, uh, appropriate needle gauges, use gel or clot activated tubes, avoid freeze and thawing of blood specimens. So you can't put into the fridge and take the sample next day and do the molecular uh, and introduction of the vacuum tubes along with the closed system of the blood collection will prevent this um, um, hemolysis. 
And these are the lipeme examples. So the other problem in the laboratories are the lipeme examples and uh, lipemia will interfere the spectrophotometric assays depending on the wavelengths. So especially uh, at uh, uh, when they are analyzing NADPH at 340 nanometers and um, which can cause pseudo hyponatremia as you all know. So um, what we can do is uh, if you are suspecting pseudo hyponatremia, we have to perform serum sodium from direct ion selective electrode and we can check with serum osmolality. So if the clinician is suspecting pseudo hyponatremia, if they ask him, so this sodium is wrong, so ask them to send uh, uh, for serum osmolality and the serum osmolality will be normal when your uh, the sodium is uh, low hyponatremic. And uh, why this is happening? So the lipemia is uh, due to a wrong timing of the sample post meal. So especially this occurs in uh, especially in pediatric population. So what we can do is uh, uh, for the pediatric populations, we can't ask them to fast. So please take the sample just before the next feed. And people who are having um, hyperlipoproteinemia uh, or the diagnosed patients, so we can ask them for overnight fasting along with the, uh, the post uh, one week treatment and we can do the testing, uh, the uh, chemical tests. And this is the responsibility of uh, the clinicians and the phlebotomists to ensure the proper patient preparation before sample collection. Did anybody so just if click your slide, uh, just click the slide that you're on the side way. Just click the slide. So this is the side. Uh, yeah. The side way, your, uh, there are slides, no, which, uh, which, which is your slide number now? What is that? So it's still yeah. you got no, uh, it's okay. Dilinika, just click the slide. The si side where there is a slide from uh, 21, 22, like. Just click on your slide. You're on. Just click. No. All right. You just click like that. Then we can see. All right. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Yeah. Right. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Dilinika, ma'am. What I want to say is. I can't hear you. When you want to move to the next slide, please click the new slide as you did now. New slide. Okay. No, Dilika, this way is okay. You just can you can you see now? Now, can you now, see now? Okay. Now we can see. Just click on slide. The when you oh, want, okay. just click on next okay. slide. Okay. Can you see now? Yes, ma'am. We, we can see. Okay, right. Okay. So, um, so then uh, I discuss uh, regarding this uh, um, lipeme examples. So, what we can do in our laboratories, we can do dilutions. Um, so that we can dilute the sample and then uh, um, uh, repeat testing after. Uh, uh, the uh, treatment for the hyperlipidemia. But in other countries, they use lipoclear. So we are to uh, precipitate the lipid components and then they will testing uh, uh, for the uh, parameters. And other thing is the bilirubin. So the bilirubin uh, uh, will be, the hemolysis will be affected the bilirubin uh, by inhibiting the diazonium color formation. And total bilirubin concentrations will be decreased even at mild demolized specimens. So we have to keep this in, the, this in your mind. And other important thing regarding the bilirubin is bilirubin is a photosensitive and um, Um, and um, it is uh, protected from the light is important. So we had to protect the bilirubin from uh, li uh, light because it is a uh, very sensitive, especially for pediatric populations, you have to be uh, keep that in your mind. And this uh, other is uh, the creatinine. The creatinine, high bilirubin concentration interfere with the Jaffe method 
a color metric method for creating measurement. So the GFAS is very alkaline and bilirubin is oxidized to be reverting during the acid period. So this will erroneously lowers the creatinine results. So we have to make comment in your report and we have to ask them to repeat serum creatinine once the bilirubin is low, or we have to ask them to monitor the kidney functions by clinical parameters or by using other parameters such as blood urea. Pseudohypokalemia. So this is, uh, uh, what, what you mean by pseudohypokalemia is marked elevation of potassium in the absence of clinical pathogen electrolyte balance. So I have already discussed regarding these mechanical issues, but I have to, um, I have to highlight regarding these patient-related factors such as thrombocytosis, erythrocytosis, leukocytosis. So those patients, they will have high potassium that is not because of uh, the actual elevation, that because of elevation of the WBs, especially in um, uh, leukemias. So when the clinicians are asking what to do, what we can do is we can ask them to um, uh, send the sample in lithium heparin tubes because this hemolysis is mainly during the uh, clot formation or either, but usually because we don't have lithium heparin um, uh, freely in uh, Sri Lanka. So I asked them to do uh, a blood gas analysis. So where it won't uh, uh, clot, they use heparin for that. So we can compare if there's any uh, problem, we can compare with the uh, blood gas analysis report. And um, pseudohyponatrium I have discussed uh, earlier also, this is uh, due to um, uh, low uh, sodium concentration, uh, irrespective of a normal serum osmolality. So there are so many causes for pseudohyponatremia. So one thing is due to accumulation of cholesterol components and other thing is due to accumulation of protein complexes. So it could be due to hypertriglyceridemia, hyperlipidemia, lipoprotein X accumulations and familial hypercholesteremia, which causes very high cholesterol levels. And accumulation of protein complexes are commonly seen in patients who are having multiple myelomas via malignant monoclonal tumorpathies and malignant lymphoproliferative disorders and myelodysplastic syndromes and even after intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. So what we can do is we can ask for the clinic and we can with the uh, uh, osmolality and we can repeat following the treatment. So I'm not going to discuss more uh, things uh, in biological variations, but we have to keep in your mind. So this, some of the errors could be due to biological variations because this is not due to any erroneous things, but if the patient is on medications and change the biochemical results, and uh, certain parameters will vary with the biological variations. And it could be, you know, that it could be intra-individual or inter-individual and patient-related physical variables such as stressors, diet and exercises can also affect the results. So we have to interpret results accordingly. So this is one study they have done to try to find uh, selected some constituents, you can see the, uh, the percentage increase and percentage increase of some of the analytes uh, biochemical parameters. So this is uh, uh, also an uh, um, um, interesting diagram. And uh, uh, what you can see, the detection and prevention of errors in laboratory medicine. So this is known as Swiss cheese model. And uh, this is uh, uh, done by, described by person known as reasons. Uh, and you can see there are two components, the gaps and the defenses. So one thing is what are the gaps in our laboratory uh, errors? So the complexity of the total testing process and uh, troubles in the boundaries, shortage of stuff and increase complexity in test uh, interpretation. And then uh, defenses are the well-designed procedures and processes, simplification and automation, training, uh, supervision, effective lab or clinical interface. So this describes 
the presence, uh, the holes describe the, uh, uh, the problems. And what he described is usually, so it is, uh, it won't go um, continuously if we, if we can defend, right? So we can, there are gaps and we can defend by using that. So we can uh, prevent uh, the laboratory errors. So patient safety corrective actions. So, so there, are, there are so many governing bodies in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka Accreditation Board and the CLIA and NICE. So they have some guidelines uh, in order to prevent this uh, or protect the patients from this laboratory errors. So what we can do is effectiveness of laboratory data communication, communication of critical results, sample acceptability and rejection criteria. So I didn't uh, tell about this acceptability and rejection criteria. So in we, we are always uh, trying to accept all the samples we are receiving in our laboratory, but it is better to reject some of the samples, but provided there should be acceptable and rejection criteria, written criteria. And when you are any, when at any time when you are going to reject the sample, we have to mention why we are going to reject those samples and the appropriateness of test request and avoid manual transcription of data. So if you are going to manual transcript or type, so there will be a lot of erroneous results. And other thing is written procedures for pre-analytical phases. Hardly, I don't think we have uh, any written procedures for pre-analytical phases. And um, we have to um, check for the personal qualifications and um, monitor sample quality indicators. And I have mentioned about the rejection criteria. And what other countries, what they use, but um, I don't think we have those uh, facilities in our country. Uh, so most of them, they have gone for modern robotic technologies. And even they have automated phlebotomy trays and uh, pre-analytical robotic workstations. And this will reduce the number of manual steps and this will reduce the laboratory errors. And barcoding and automated, uh, automatic detection of serum indices such as uh, hemolysis index. So this is the index level. So even our uh, in, uh, in uh, the latest analysis, we have this index levels. So that is hemoglobin, icterus, and lipemia. So we there are index levels and according to the concentration or magnitude of the hemolysis, lipemia and the icterus, so they provide the index level. So we can even we can uh, um, sometimes we can put that index level or we can put a comment. At least uh, we can what we can do is uh, we can stop sending uh, erroneous reports. And little bit about uh, um, uh, pre analytical errors in urine and feces. It is important when you are uh, using the time collections of the urine, especially for 24 hours. Because if you uh, take the, because we will take the, uh, the volume of the urine. So if it is erroneous, what will uh, cause is the excretion uh, values will be wrong. So patient has to be clearly instruct for 24 hour urinary collections. And what about this preservative? Sometimes the patient do uh, throw away the preservative. So clear instruction not to uh, discard the preservatives. Much and we have to clearly instruct all for the pre analytical phase. So, now a little bit about the analytical phase. So, this analytical phase begins with the um, patient, uh, patient uh, specimen is prepared for testing, verified and advances of field of medical diagnostic. Uh, this uh, our laboratories now, it has gone from manual cumbersome testing to fully automated systems, as I mentioned earlier, which causes low analytical errors. But still, we have to look into analytical errors and because still there are some concerns about uh, the issues, uh, because uh, there could be inaccuracies, imprecisions, poor sensitivity and specificity, linear issues. And nowadays, uh, it is important to check for any interfering substances. 
So that is important because still we are struggling with interfering substance, especially hemolysis like in an icterus. But for um, yes, and um, and for hormones, there are lots of interfering substance. Will I, I will discuss later on. So analytical errors we can prevent it by proper uh, quality control procedures, IQCs and EQV. So we are um, not only we have to um, go for these uh, uh, programs, but we have to interpret the reports. So most of the time we will um, register and we will uh, uh, submit the results, but hardly we see the reports. And then we have to detect the trends and biases, and we have to find the root cause. Why, where, other thing is apply and monitor the actions for removing underlying causes and um, we have to check especially after EQA reports whether we, whether if we have gone wrong so ideally we have to recall the reports so I don't think Sri Lanka we do it but other countries they do it right they recall the reports if there's any big uh, it's a significant deviation. So now, um, as a interference for whole and uh, biotin interference and cross-reactivity of steroid hormones. So those are the challenging uh, analytical um, errors nowadays. So there are very corrective actions for each uh, one. But uh, I have tell one thing, uh, if, if, if clinician is suspecting any um, uh, interference, essay interference, few things we can do. One thing is, we can repeat the, uh, uh, we can ask for a new sample and we can go for a, uh, repeat testing. So if we get the same results and then we have to go for like, uh, uh, we can go for like uh, dilutions and uh, check for linearity, but we can't do protein binding and like such as T T4, that's free T4, we can't do it, but TSH, yes, we can do it. And the other thing is we can uh, go for a different assay platform for we can double check from different assay platform because I'm getting lot, lots and lots of complaints regarding whether this is assay interference with ESH. So what we can do is we can go for another platform, but we have to make sure that uh, it's not a different um, analyzer. So ideally we have to check for the antibodies. What are the antibodies they are using in that platform, right? And then uh, in other countries, they use heterophile antibodies to block the, uh, the antibodies like HAMA and uh, the antibodies which cause interference. But in Sri Lanka, we don't have heterophile antibody blocking tubes. And uh, I'm not going to discuss many, but what I'm going to highlight is what we can do. How, what are the improvements in analytical phase we can do is one thing is we can go for laboratory accreditation and there we should have written policies and processes and procedure manuals we can have and proper training and participate in proficiency testing and um, maintenance of the records of the uh, laboratory environment and proper maintenance of the equipment and the analyzers. A little bit about the post analytical phase. So that is results are reviewed and related to the clinicians and the clinicians will be interpreted and make the diagnostics and the therapeutic decisions. So the significant contribution to errors in the post analytical phase is due in the reporting and erroneous validation of analytical data. And yeah, uh, so sometimes it is incorrect data entry. And um, what are the requirements the laboratories? We have to report the stat results, critical values. We should aware about the critical values and uh, which reduces the uh, human errors uh, and um, by root cause analysis, process control and education and communication. So this is the critical values used in Royal College of Pathologists. So in our laboratories, we should have our own critical values. So we have ideally given to medical laboratory technologists and medical officers. So they have to uh, inform the results accordingly. So I'm not going to discuss these uh, things, but this is the, what they use in Royal College of Pathologists. 
And in the next few minutes, like one or two minutes, I'm going to discuss regarding a very short thing about the survey, which is conducted in the UK because it is important, but we can have our own service because I don't think in Sri Lanka, we don't do much uh, service in pre-analytical and post-analytical phases, right? So this is uh, uh, the, this pre-analytical working group, like uh, this is uh, uh, together with like uh, ACB. So they used laboratory information management system for this survey. And uh, pre analytical errors were recorded and how they were classified and gauge interest in external quality. This is like an external quality program, right? So in other countries, they even, even they used to do like EQA programs for the pre-analytical phase even, right? So the laboratory responses were received from 104 uh, laboratories. And this survey, they have asked some questions. So what, uh, do you uh, measure the eligible requests? So percentage samples uh, with a uh, test were not requested, how many samples not received, and uh, how many samples, the percentage of hemolysis, lipemia, and so on, right? So, so there are so many questions, right? And then this survey, they, they are uh, about the percentages they have mentioned, they are how much percentage uh, according to that uh, questions. So strategies to improve patient safety. We can approach in person, um, legal approach also there, but I don't think we practice legal approach and we can ap approach systematically also. So those are the things basically for impo uh, improve the patient safety. So my sl last slide, take home message. Provide effective diagnostic services to the patient. And most at most important thing is we have to communicate and cooperation with the clinicians uh, are the crucial to avoid errors because hardly we communicate hardly we inform regarding this analytical uh, the errors which occurs in the laboratories and adoption of quality controls we have to strictly adapt external quality assurance uh, programs and internal quality controls and appraisers and audits I don't think we perform audits in our laboratories. It is, we, I don't think much we, are, we, we must, but it is not much like we are not doing it regularly. And incident reporting laboratory quality services. So in other countries, they use incident reporting in each and every uh, laboratory errors, right? There is a form which we have to fill it and we have to mention about the, what is the incident which occurs and we have to put the corrective actions and there will be like, uh, 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 like uh, continuous uh, meetings and uh, like uh, discussions regarding these errors. Ultimate goal is to safeguard our patients. Thank you very much and very extremely sorry for the inconvenience happened due to this, uh, I think due to um, internet, extremely sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Belinika. Uh, if you all have uh, one or two questions, you can, uh, over any comments, uh, you can, I can give one to two minutes for you all. Anyway, I have one experience a uh, uh, couple of days back. Uh, yeah, uh, one lab issue very high creatinine, uh, something like around eight. And uh, actually uh, that patient had normal creatinine and ultimately it is due to pre-analytical error and they have transported the urine with uh, urine and the blood together. The probable cause ultimately decide as, uh, decided as the contamination of urine with blood. So anyway, this topic is very important. You all can ask if you all to, if you all want to talk, you can talk now. Okay, thank you, Dilinika. Anyway, uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Tushar Hebagegana, Joint Secretary, CCPSL, Consultant Chemical Pathologist, TH, uh, Teaching Hospital, Anuradhapura, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Ms. Uh, let me take this uh, opportunity to thank 
Dr. Dilinika Pereira, consultant chemical pathologist, Sirimau Bandaranaika Specialized Children's Hospital, Peradenia, on behalf of College of Chemical Pathologist, Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Dilinika, for doing this excellent lecture. And also a very special thank for taking over the challenge of doing this lecture with a very short notice. I also thank all the participants who join us with this meeting from all over the country. Without you, this event won't be a success. And see you all very soon with another webinar like this. Thank you very much. Thank you.